Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everybody here today. And for those that I didn't have an opportunity yet to uh, walk around and shake your hand, good morning to you. I hope that you are having a good day. It seems like it's a wonderful February day out there today. It's supposed to be up close to 60, even though we had to deal with a little bit of fog this morning. So, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about biblical prophecy in the Old Testament and how it pertains to Jesus Christ and the different aspects of his life. Today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the prophecies that kind of deal with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So there are a lot in there that, to cover over these, so we probably won't cover them all, but uh, we are going to cover a few of them. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, and in the book of Psalms, there are a lot of prophecies about Christ. And if we start in Exodus chapter 12, and I'll tell you that right now, so it'll give you some time to get there while I'm kind of going through here. Now, not all of these prophecies are, are direct. Some of them are, are symbolic or symbolism. Now, there's a lot of symbolism throughout the Bible. And symbolism is used in the Old Testament to point to Christ. In today's Sunday school lesson, let's look at some of the Old Testament symbols that are directly related to Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Our faith is built upon Jesus and his sacrifice for us in his resurrection. We serve a living Savior. The world would like nothing better but to leave Christ up on the tree or buried in the tomb. And I'm so glad that we can say that we have a personal savior, that we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him because he lives. In the Old Testament, in Exodus, at the end of the plagues of Egypt, Pharaoh still would not let the children of Israel leave. Not until the last, which was the striking down of the firstborn in Egypt. In chapter 12 of Exodus, we can see the symbolisms of the lamb, which is to sacrifice to protect the Israelites. This became known as the Passover. And we're getting fairly close to, to, uh, to, to Easter. And uh, in the coming weeks, I'll probably be talking about the Passover and probably be talking about the temple and how it relates to Christ. But today we're going to talk about, uh, in Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 21, about his blood. And it says, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. And he shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep his service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passes over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshiped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did, or so did they, as it is written. Now, we all know what happened to those families back there in Egypt. That those that did not have the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame to their house. Now, they lost their firstborn male child. 
whether it was people or whether it was livestock and animals, that firstborn was sacrificed, was, was lost. I, I guess I shouldn't say the term sacrifice because it wasn't a sacrifice to the Lord, but the Lord had taken their firstborn. This, now the world still observes the Passover. It has been, uh, it was such a traumatic event that the world still observes it. This takes place just before we celebrate Easter. This year, Passover starts on the 4th of April, and Easter is observed on the 9th. Christ, whose blood covers us, is our Passover lamb. And if we look in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, we can see where this prophecy is basically written out in the New Testament. Now, I'll give you a little bit of time to get to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. We'll start in verse number 7 when you get there. But I want you to take a moment and think about that first Passover. The story is very well known to all of those that have been in church all of their lives. And it's fairly well known to the, uh, to the outside world, too. I mean, growing up, you know, Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments, you know, you can kind of see a few things. And you see him with the rod, and you see Aaron, who's supposed to be there. Mr. Heston doesn't do a very good job of Moses, if you think about it. Because Moses did, had, a, had a speech problem. Mr. Heston really did not. <laughs> so if you follow with me in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, it says in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So right there, uh, the, the prophet, uh, not the prophets, but the, the apostles and, and those that came after are identifying Christ as our Passover. He is the sacrifice that was made once for the whole world. His blood covers us covers us like the blood on the side posts and the lentil. So we have forgiveness of our sins. We are capable of being the children of God if you know him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you don't, you are like the Egyptians. Another important act, uh, aspect of this sacrifice of the Passover is that it was commanded not to break any of the bones of the lamb. And if we still look in Exodus chapter 12, if you stay there, and you go down to verses 46, it'll talk about that where Moses was commanded, or Moses commanded them not to, to break the bones. That means that none of the bones of the lamb could be broken. This is very important because Christ is our perfect sacrifice. Our lamb on the cross did not have any of his bones broken. And in Exodus 40, uh, 12, 46, it says, In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh brought out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. And then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is home born and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did the children of Israel as the Lord commanded. Moses and Aaron, so did they. So think about it. This is the feast of the Passover. What do we do now 
that is a reminder of that. If you think about it, it's the Lord's Supper, where he, before he became, uh, before he was sacrificed, broke bread and gave it to his disciples. That's all part of this, and it was part of the, the point of what he was going to go ahead and do for us. Now this is fulfilled in John chapter number 19, and if you'll turn to John chapter 19, we'll start in verse 31 when, I get, when you have an opportunity to get there. Because Christ was sacrificed at the time of the Passover, they did not want the bodies to be left on the cross. And over the time frame and the reason for this, it is written in John. It's a familiar passage, so let's look to John chapter 19, which prophesizes why Christ's bones were not broken. It says on, in verse 31, it says, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that, the say, that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So if we take a look at that, and we dissect this a little bit, we know that the Passover lamb was not a bone broken. And in Christ here, we know through the New Testament that none of his was broken either while he was on the cross. There are a lot of different prophecies that go into the life of Christ. And these are just a few. Now there's not a direct prophecy but he, uh, but he fulfilled this one once and always, is the shedding of the blood for the atonement. I'm not sure this would be considered a prophecy, but if we study and we look in the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 17, and we start in verse 11, it talks about the blood of atonement. So in Leviticus... Chapter number 17, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and it hath have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. In verse 12, Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. So we see it is through the blood that atonement for sin is made. Whose blood is more precious to have been laid upon the altar to God the Father than Jesus Christ, God the Son? I say to you that the author that I was looking at for a Good News Testament reference for this verse, they chose as a prophecy in the Old Testament the verse found that was just discussed. But for the, the New Testament, they chose Matthew. And there are many different references to Christ's blood in the New Testament. But if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 26, and let's look at verse 28 to read how Jesus is the final fulfillment of any sacrifice for the redemption of sin. Christ himself is telling his disciples what his blood represents and how when we partake of the Lord's Supper, why symbolically partake in his death on the cross. 
Starting in verse number 27, he says, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Blood. Life is in the blood. And through the Old Testament and through the New Testament, that fact has been reiterated over and over again, is that life is in the blood. The blood comes from the Father's side. If you look at it from a biological standpoint, the male has the, the live swimmers. The female has the egg. It's stationary. The blood comes through, through something that's alive. That is why we say that the blood comes from the male side. The taking of blood has great meaning. Partaking of the Lord's Supper should never be done without examination. Remember, his blood was shed for each one of us. To be covered by his blood is the ultimate gift any one of us could receive. And then there's an Old Testament prophecy about the serpent on the staff that was lifted up by Moses. That has specific meaning because Jesus was also lifted up on the cross. So if we take a look at Numbers, we'll see this. In Numbers chapter number 21, and we'll start in verse 5, but the primary verse is verse 9. It'll talk about the bronze snake and the reason for it and the reason why it was lifted up. So please turn to Numbers 21, verse 5. And it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? So, as you can tell here, the nation of Israel's a little disgruntled out in the wilderness. And they're complaining to, uh, about God and Moses. So it says, For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. So basically, they're complaining about the manna. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole and it came to pass that if any serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now there's a couple things in here that if you just read it, you might not take away from it. First of all, they went to Moses as an intercessor for him. They did not go directly to the Lord themselves, they went to Moses. Moses went to the Lord because he was the, the voice in the mouthpiece for Israel to the Lord. The Lord gave them a command. Moses followed through with that, and then anyone that looked upon it was saved if they were bitten. Now, this is one of those symbolisms that crosses over to the life of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but my wife's not a big fan of snakes. Sorry, hon. And I would have to say, a fiery serpent is not something that I would want to run into. The New Testament verse that fulfills this portion of Scripture that is like prophecy is discussed in John chapter 3. 
John chapter 3 is a very familiar chapter for most people. And if we uh, look in verse 14, and we go through verse 18, we'll see what is written in John's book here. It says, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And John 3.16 is a very familiar verse, so most of you should know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But in verse 14, God himself is saying that he must be lifted up. And just like those that looked upon the snake in the wilderness, it says that he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. That's just like if you, you get bit and you look up and you look at the snake, all of a sudden the Lord is going to save you and heal you. It's the same thing with Christ. Here, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have salvation and you will be saved. If you don't believe, then you have already committed yourself to hell. It's all about obedience, yes, brother. So as Christ was lifted up on the cross, just as the bronze servant was lifted up, and all those that looked upon them that believed were saved. We have all either heard or read what the Lord said on the cross. And in Matthew 27, it records the Lord's word on the cross. If we look at verse number 46 of Matthew 27, and I've kind of reversed the order here on this thing. I'm going to give you the New Testament verse before I, we go back and take a look at what was fulfilled. So Matthew Chapter 27, in verse 46, says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Hopefully I have that pronunciation right. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, in the Old Testament, we can read this. It's in the book of Psalms, and we're going to be in Psalms 22 until I finish Sunday school for the Old Testament. You'll see it is uh, in verse number one. It says in Psalms 22, to the chief musician from, hopefully I can say this right, Aliath Shahar, a psalm of David, it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? David is crying out, just as the Lord Jesus did on the cross. The same words, the same symbolism. And we know that all things work together for the glory of God. So I think we can conclude that what David wrote was not just by accident in Psalms. It foreshadowed what the Lord would say on the cross and how lonely it had to be for him to say that. If you think about it, that was the first time that he had ever been separated from God the Father. Now, in my study, I was looking at this article that discusses prophecies and how Jesus would be scorned. All of this is part of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. All of these things had to happen in order for Christ to fulfill the prophecies, in order for him to fulfill his Father's commandment, his love for us in order for us to, to have a way, to make a way for us to be able to come to the Father. So this is another one that is spoken of in Psalms by David. 
in Psalms 22. If we go down to verses 7 through 9, it says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he, may, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. And in Matthew chapter 27, if we stay there in the New Testament, in verses 42 and 43, it tells us how Christ was treated by those that saw him on the cross. And I'll start in verse 39 of Matthew 27. And it says, And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. We have all been there at some point in our life. I'm sure everyone in this room can remember a bully, can remember somebody that didn't treat them very well, that mocked them for some reason. I know that when I went through school, I was not one of the most popular kids in my school. I'll give you a little background on, on me. I was born in a little place called Bismarck, North Dakota. I lived in a small town called Moffat. I was bused to another town called Hazleton. Well, when you're the bus kid and you come in, you're usually not one of the most well-liked because you're not really part of the community. So I understood persecution. Got dropped on my head a few times, got beat up, so. But we all survive it. And with the Lord's help, we make it through. And we have the ability to have forgiveness. I want you to not take away here from this prophecy the scorn, but the love that Christ had to have for all of those people, even those that mocked him, that made fun of him, that ridiculed him, that didn't understand what they were doing. But because of only his love for us, he went through that. Um, I've kind of come kind of late to life to be standing up here in front of, uh, of you all and, and talking and teaching. Hopefully, you know, I'm doing a, a good job for the Lord here. I'm letting him lead me in the direction that he thinks that I should go. And I think that's the only thing that any of us can honestly, truly say and do. If the Lord is working on your heart, then you need to follow it. Even if it is something as drastic as what the Lord faced, if you do it in his love, nothing can stop you. So the next two uh, items that I got from my study here on, uh, on different prophecies on the Lord, I'm going to put them together because they deal with the piercing of his hands and his feet and how he thirsted. And if we stay back there in Psalms chapter 22, it says in verse 15 and verse 16, it says, my strength is dried up like the pot's shed. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. 
So back in the Psalm of David there, it talks about what's going to take place. And in John, if you'll go back to John chapter number 19, we can read all about that. And we'll start in verse 28 of chapter 19. But as you're turning there, I want you to think about the Lord up on the cross. When they put the nails through his hands and through his feet, they did not break one bone. And it says in verse 28, excuse me, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, and I believe we've gone over this before, but I'll read it again, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and the other that was crucified. And if we go down to verse 35, and it says, and he saw it bear record, and this his record is true, for he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So if you think about it, the Lord was pierced five times. He was pierced in each hand, both feet, and then the soldier who pierced him through his side with the sword in order to allow the blood and the water to come out. Now remember, they were not mixed. That is a, a sign that someone is truly dead, is if the water and the blood has been separated within the body. Some of you may not know that. I did not know that until I had to look it up. Did you have something, Brother Hugh? When someone dies, the water separates itself from the blood. And if we continue to look in Psalms 22, this will be the last one for today. We can see Jesus, the discussion on Jesus' clothing. I'm sure that you're all familiar that they parted his garments but his, uh, I think if they call it his vest vesture, they did not uh, cut or separate. So if we take a look at uh, Psalms 22 and in verse 18, it says, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now if we go back to chapter 19 of John, we can see how the Roman soldiers at the foot of the cross, basically, are gambling to see who gets what pieces of clothing. And in chapter 19, starting in verse number 23, it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend, or rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, there were multiple other uh, Old Testament references to things, and I did not write them all down because there were so many of them. But if we just take a look at these that we've looked at today, it's kind of hard to deny that Christ was the Savior. How can you fulfill so many Old Testament prophets, prophecies and not be the one? The world would try to tell you that your faith is 
lost, your faith is wrong, you don't have anything. These are all scriptures that we can point to. These are all scriptures that point to Christ in his redeeming value on the cross for us, his reason for us to have salvation. I'll give you another reference for later on. If you look at Psalms 31, in verse number five, it'll talk about Christ being able to give his, uh, uh, commit his spirit to the Father. And in Luke 23, verse number 46, it'll tell you that, you know, where the Lord says, uh, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit. These are all things that were done for his death. I didn't even get into the burial and the resurrection. I'll probably cover those along with his, uh, the, the, the prophecies that deal with us in the New, uh, New Testament church. There are a couple in the Old Testament that point to the, to the New Testament church. According to the article that I was reading, and I'm still researching it, so I'm still going through it, still doing my study. And I hope that each one of you are looking in your Bibles, that you're reading it, that you're studying it, because the Bible says to study to show thyself approved. And we get to sit here and, and discuss it amongst ourselves and hopefully learn from each other. I hope that you have gotten something from this from me that the Lord spoke to your heart about it, that you may not have realized that some of these things were written in the Old Testament that helped point to Christ in the new. If you will, bow your heads with me and we'll close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the words that you've given me. And I thank you for being able to prove scripture with scripture. Lord, your grace is more than we can ever imagine. And Lord, I know that at one day, we all have an appointment to see you. And Lord, I look forward to that day. Lord, I ask that you would be with this church in the, the mission that is, it has, and that you would be with us for this missions week for looking at the, the different countries and the different things that you'd be with Daniel or whoever is up here to give the main message today, that you would have on our hearts the thing that you would have us to do, to be, and to know. Lord Jesus, we know that you are the author and the finisher of all of our work. And Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient for each and every one of us. We just have to be willing to accept it. Lord, I thank you. And Lord, we pray that you would just bless this service. In your name we pray, amen.